Mm. I just wait lah, maybe until thirty. I think. Okay. I think my workshop not that long today. I I usually go too long, so today I said I will go shorter. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. Anyone here? Uh, they want to have a chit chat. Hi Tim. Hello Hi, Tim. Hi Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Oh, I I thought others would be more interesting. <laughs> 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 no, I I always attend yours, Tim. Oh, thank you. It's always something to learn from you. My pleasure. <laughs> so today will be something definitely something different. Hmm. Um, Banu, maybe I just start. Yeah, can sit Tim. Okay, hi everyone. Just welcome to workshop uh eleven. I'm Timothy Wong. Uh, this is emotional vocabulary for emotional well being. So while we wait for others, you will of course be you hear the music, right? <laughs> so one of the things that I do in my class, if I am doing this particular topic, is that uh to sort of like help them to get in that particular state. Many many students said, you know, either they say that this music makes them fall asleep, or it helps them. All right, and usually um for those who are very anxious, this will be very helpful. All right, let's start now. Oh, sorry, something dropped. Okay, hold on, yeah. Okay, now what I'm teaching here is actually the there are five components in what you call the social emotional learning, and this is only the first component. And this I'm using what you call a person centered approach. All right. And the reason why I did this, it wasn't just because of the COVID. Uh, this happened a few years back. I noticed my students were very uh, anxious, and as I got into, uh, I'm doing a master's now in professional counseling. As I got into it, I realized that some of them may be anxious, uncertain, and somehow they responded to me when I uh, when I. Talk to them about it or ask them. They said they were anxious and all things because the the program that I'm doing in Monash is called MEB Monash English Bridging. It is very intensive, and the tests and assessments are quite hard, and so the stakes are high. And so students coming in, especially those, uh, they only have band five point five IELTS, and so it gives them some form of a Anxiety. So this particular mode I'm using is only model one. You know where they are talking about self awareness. Huh? So this this building emotional vocabulary becomes sort of like a bridge to help them to build some emotional competence and self awareness. When they have self awareness, they not to say that the anxiety go away, but there are ways and means to help them to feel not so um, tense. All right. So the activity in itself doesn't go into uh, the relieving of that tenseness or the anxiety, but it helps because this is just the first part. So self awareness, all right. Okay. So there are three things that I'm going to do today. First of all, the exercises on identifying emotions. Hopefully, you will join me. But I'm going to go a little bit quick because um, there are different levels here for all the teachers you're teaching. Some may be primary, some may be lower secondary, some may higher, and like myself, some of you might be towing college students. So different approach, but the idea is to identify emotions. Secondly, I want to tell you some of the things that related to emotions that you need to know a little bit, so that you don't feel offended or you don't know what to do when things happen. And some, and the last part, I'll give you some helpful tools. All right, how to help them do something and very simple things that uh, will make them calm down. Like for example, this playing this music. All right, will help them. Okay. All right. So first part, identifying emotions. Now, what is an emotion? So a lot of this is taken from uh, Hockenberry and Hockenberry, two thousand seven. He said emo emotion is a complex psychological state that includes three components. I wonder if in the chat, in the chat, 
would you want to write out what you think are the three components? Any component, what do you think happens? You know, when you talk about emotion, what do you think happens? Uh, would you try? Feelings, well-being, good. Others? Okay. All right. The first one that that comprise what are the three components? The first component of good mental state, feelings by yourself, positive, calm, negative, feelings or so all most of you are only giving me the one of them, one component. Okay. The first component you need to know is there is what you call a subjective experience. All right. So your emotion doesn't come out of what you call it out of a vacuum. It's like tiba tiba, you feel emotional, tiba tiba, you feel happy. You know, it comes from a subjective experience. I'll explain what is subjective experience later. The second thing is you have a physiological response, meaning you have a um, but your, you will respond in your body and you respond in terms of body means and sens physical sensations and you have also feelings, all right? So that's a physiological response. And for some people, they say that because you have a thought, some schools said you have a thought, therefore you have these emotions, you have these feelings and then come to the third part in the emotions, all right? You have the behavioral expression. And that's what we see most of the time in class, you know, the furrowed brow, you know, the tears coming down, you know, or the blank face, you know, or, or, the, or the one who is like, you know, they're looking out, they're like very fidgety. So that's the behavioral expression, right? So there are two things behind it. Okay, let's go to the next one. So basically, these are the three elements. The subjective experience can be anything, all right? Uh, and then the physiological response, and usually some for those who are in the primary school, the, 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 the younger you are, you have what you call the physiological response. The physical sensations are more evident. The older you are, unfortunately, we are sometimes able to mask it or dull it or just ignore it. Uh, for example, if some of you are anxious right now, you may be able to say, okay, stop the, the fluttering, butterflies fluttering. You can do something. All right, to avoid feeling it. But the behavioral response is what you do when you have it. For example, if you're very nervous, you can be fidgeting, you can be like, you know, you can be tapping your feet, uh, or you can be speaking very fast. Uh, all right. So one of the ways after I tell you is to close the okay. All right, so these are the three components. You have the situation the bodily sensations, emotional expressions, all right? So I'm just making it simpler, all right? So you need to have a situation. What does the situation trigger you to do? What are the bodily sensations you feel or might not feel as you are older, all right? Okay, so because some people have dulled them, all right? They ignore it so they don't feel it, okay? Emotional expression. This is also something that uh, may or may not, you may or may not feel so... Uh, uh, what's the word? So strongly, all right? Research shows that male doesn't feel so much of these emotions so much, all right? Later, we will find out. Okay, so let's go on to what I mean by subjective. Now, subjective means it is something that the person you experience, all right? You experience and your it leads to a perception. The perception... That seems to be a, a, a sound, Banu. Is it coming from me? No, huh? no, no, it was another participant. Okay, all right. So the subjective means that I go through the situation and I may feel good, bad, or even neutral. For example, if you look at the picture that at a sale, for some people, it's fantastic, you know? Oh, God, like me, I like sales. So, yeah. But for some, it's like, oh, my God, this is going to take so long, you know? The dreaded feeling. Remember, same situation, different reaction but some people just said neutral all right so depending like for some people work gives you a bad perception of things all right like for some people feel that smoking drinking you know all this wonderful you know alcohol all this wonderful you know it doesn't give me anything it mean you may not even think that you have bad results but that is what i mean by subjective okay so when it is Subjective. So now the next part is bodily sensation. All right. Can all of you sort of identify one bodily sensation? 
uh, bodily sensation. What is going to any picture? You can type down your answer or you can shout it out. All right. I sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, what else? What else happening? Back pain for me. Back pain. Okay, so that is sensation. So usually the bodily sensation that we do feel is pain related. Okay. Mm. Pain related. And therefore we got aches, we got a lot of things. However, however, that is not all the, the whole picture. All right. For example, it can be emotionally related. It can like for example, your heart is pounding. Uh, your tummy is fluttering. Okay. It can be related to itches. You know, for example, it's itching, it's twitching. Uh, uh, I feel my hands are very clammy. Uh, my, 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 my feet are, you know, are sore, all right? So you have things like that. So bodily sensations. Now, knowing bodily sensations, I also teach my, uh, my students this, you know, so that they know what is it? Is it a bodily sensation or is it an emotional? That's very, that you need to differentiate that. And many a times, especially in, um, when I'm doing counseling, all right, uh, as a student counsellor, I counsel sometimes. What, what's, what a lot of uh, people tell me when I ask them, how are you feeling? They usually say bodily sensation, all right, bodily sensation. Now, being able to locate what is wrong in your body is the first step to knowing something might be wrong, something, all right, can be physical, can be physiological, all right? So that gives you an indication. For example, last week, I seem to have a shoulder ache here. I was telling myself, what is it? What is wrong with it? Is it, is it the food I ate? Is it what? Finally, I realized what it was. It was, um, has to do with a little bit of doing too much of these slides. I've been, I've been doing these slides for a while. So a little bit with how I'm using my right hand, right hand to use the mouse. And so that has, and coupled with a lack of sleep some nights, it, it gave me a shoulder ache, you know? And then of course, when I found it, I realized so I, I could do something about it, all right? All right, so what you can do as a teacher for sensational description is, Attach the sensation to a body part and make an interesting sentence, all right? And for example, what I usually do, like for example, you can easily get a picture at the side when you Google it, all right? For example, I will ask them, you know, okay, when you're feeling, what are those at the side? If you look at it, I look at the side. Some are positive, some are negative, and some are mixed. For example, you have words like uh, uh, flowing. It is mixed. Huh? It can be positive, it can be negative. Strong can be positive, can be negative. Okay, uh, if you if you if you feel you got a heart, strong heartbeat, that's great. But if you have a strong and pounding heartbeat, you may be having a panic attack, an anxiety attack. Light is also good. All right, another new in the sense neutral. All right, oh, I I feel light. You know, there's you know my whole body feel light. It's like you do not have any diseases. But sometimes what happens is that you can also feel light headed. Right, like hit it. Uh, so with the sensational descriptions, you can help them to able to be more uh, descriptive. These are very descriptive, very helpful, especially if you are teaching them uh, things like personal narrative. Uh, so rather than always say I'm confused, you know, so they can say you know, oh, I feel fuzzy, uh, or they also can say that you know, this seems to be quite dizzying for me. Yeah. So it depends on how you work. But bodily sensations is a wealth of vocabulary that able for them to attach it firstly to their body. Later on, they can use it as an extension uh, of the metaphor for emotions. Let's go to the next part. All right. So a little bit about what happens with bodily. Uh, now this research, uh, you can, as you can see, the bodily maps of emotions, uh, the research shows uh, by these people and this uh, for the few people that do it, all right, they use MRI. Uh, and there are 13 emotions and there are corresponding body parts that they activate and don't activate. All right, so you can see the color, you can see sadness. Sadness, red means it's activated. Blue means it's very dominant. 
So you can feel very warm or very painful at the chest level or even the head level, tears. But you can feel that maybe your arms are very cold. You know, you may feel. So that's the research they've done. I'll give you another one. All right. So if you look here, there are a few here. You got surprise. You got anxiety. Look, look at depression. And why now? Probably we all know why. Oh, that's why they said oh, we're feeling blue. We are feeling blue because normally when you have depression, you have no energy. All right, blue means the energy is down, uh, down, uh, not so warm. Uh, it goes down, so you feel like you know there's death. So you can see that. As you can see with sadness, same with sadness. All right, but as you look with anger, look at anger, anger here, anger. <laughs> wow, you know. But you look at happiness. Happiness and love. When you have happiness, love, you feel all warm, fuzzy. So this, this is a bodily sensation. Eh? It doesn't tell you what you are feeling yet. All right, but they have the research they have done it. And let's see what the research says. Eh? Okay. The intensity of the emotions is directly linked with the intensity of the physical sensations. All right. Uh, so this, this, this is something that we need to understand that how we feel in the body may be attached to a emotion if we are aware, right? Now, I need to say that most students are not aware, especially the students we teach. It's not that they are, but they, they haven't seen life circumstances yet. And in Asian context, very sadly, right? We are, we are asked, both male and female, we are asked not to show our emotions. Emotions are bad. It's shameful and don't cry. Especially the wonderful boys don't cry, you know? Uh, They'll tell you, don't do all these things. Just snuff it in, snuff it in. That's what happened. Okay. Yes. Uh, the reason why they feel so intense, one of the reasons they feel so intense about it is that they actually buried it. And the more you bury your emotions later, as I will tell you, the more you bury your emotions, the stronger you actually feel it. All right. But you don't feel it as that as an emotion. So you might feel it as an with your bodily sensation and emotions, so it's it, it very strongly. And not fortunately, unfortunately, at 12 and at 18, we have the wonderful hormonal outburst, you know, the peak, you know, especially 18. So you have that, all right? So knowing that and helping, knowing that about your students will help you to, to know what to do, all right? What to do. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later, okay? Now, the next part, let's, let's look at this picture. Oh, sorry, not this one. Okay, let's look at this picture. Let's look at this picture, all right? Let's look at uh, number five is easier. Number five, so, so sometimes your face or your demeanor will show the emotions, all right? The emotions. So then now we're coming to the emotional part. How to identify the emotions? How do you identify students' emotion? And how do you help students identify? Number five is easy. Number five, happy joyful, glad, all right? So I'm going to test all of you. Okay, look at, look at number two. Look at number two, okay? Look at number two. And what do you think is the expression? All right? Okay, what do you think is the expression for number two? Can you just type it in or you can say it out, anyone? Bored, like, oh my gosh, is it again, it's happening again. Yes, okay. So the emotions can be bored. What else? What else can there be? Because the picture alone expresses a few. Eh? Disappointed. Yes, can be disappointed, sorrowful, mournful. One more. Ah, yes, disturbed. Yes, disturbed. Yes, in despair. Yes, uh, apprehensive. Okay. Now, I just tell you what is. Now, these are pictures done by um, a person who, um, whose psychology looks at the picture and the, then they interview what's the emotion. So, this is something that. That he has done research and now is doctor. So number one is actually is disgust. All right, disgusted, disgusted. That that's a look of disgusted. All right, or contemptuous. All right. Number three, very easy, a surprise, astonish. All right, and not and if the expression from number three grow into one or four or something that it becomes very shocked or horrified or terrified. Okay. Okay, number three. And number four, of course, it is the angry, mad, irritated, evade, annoyed, all right, all that. Uh, and if it extends a little bit more, you, we have the person being enraged, okay, enraged, all right. Uh, so it is good 
with having pictures like that, you can use pictures to ask students to say what they feel, how they're doing it, attach it, and then do some role play with this, some role play, you know. Uh, now, the idea of doing this exercise is not just to for vocabulary, but to actually help them to see where they are and later on able to. Because if you have self-awareness, it is helpful. It is helpful, okay? Let's go next to another activity that you can do. All right, now, this one, I am going to, um, oh dear, this particular one, I forgot, okay. Uh, I've clicked it, let's see if I can click it, okay. Can you all see the Google? Can you all oh. see? No, okay. Okay, now my what I'm going to do is, I am going to put this in the chat for all of you to have a go everyone in the meeting okay so and, and keep this keep this and i'm going to go to that space we are not going to play with this today all right but i'm just going to show you show it to you so that you got something interesting to to play with this is something interesting okay and my students love it okay uh let me just go let me show you okay so this uc berkeley research they have come up with a map, okay, a map of uh, of a sound. So when you hover over it, when you go, actually, you click the image, yeah? you click the image, you hover over it, you will hear the sound. And they have to guess what is the sound. You you already know, so you can play and ask them, so guess what is the, this sound best, all right? You can do that. Let me just try whether, because it takes a while, depending on the line and the, okay. So as you can hear, I'm going to stop the, the music for a while. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop the music. Uh, then you can hear the sound. And what does the sound? And you'll be very surprised. And uh, if uh, now let me tell you that some of the sounds can be, uh, uh, you see? Okay. Simple. Okay. Uh, now, I need to say that when you play with it on your own, you will find out they all do not just sound so adult, okay, user, right? So some they are, but they are real, real sounds from people and it's, it's quite interesting, all right? Quite interesting, especially sounds for distress, all right? But you need to know your student's level. If some of them can't take uh, distress or shock, don't, don't let them hear them, all right? So you need to protect them. That. But so you can go to elation. Uh, for our confusion, a contempt. Uh, there's a few sounds there, right? Okay. And I thought it would be interesting and share with all of you so that uh, you can play it with your students. You know, you can play it, ask them what you think, what you think this is the sound, you know. Of course, choose the one that will may generate some laughter as well, all right? May generate some laughter. Okay. Uh, especially, I like to do this when I am doing. Um, uh, I'm doing what you call the uh, listening. I'm doing this uh, listening. Okay, just sorry. Okay, now the next part. Can you see the screen now? Is am I still sharing? Yes. Um, okay. All right. So right now the next part is actually down to the nitty gritty of the language, but I make it a little bit fun. Like for example, let me ask you. Embed like for example, except for the word gold. All right, so these are different words to, to want to, um, to show. I, I have different words or different words. For example, go, you can get the same word, from these words out of the word allegedly. All right, so I just want to go and let's look at the first word, absently. All right, what is the word, uh, is five letter word, five letter word that describes something bad. Uh, so some people who like word games, this is fantastic. Yeah? Absolutely. Uh, it is all mixed up. Using five letters only, what is a word that can come up to say bad? Or angry. Angry. Anyone? Maybe I give you as an example. From the word absently, you can find out the word. I, Beast is an animal, but you want a, a feeling, a feeling word. The feeling word is nasty. 
Okay, nasty. All right. Look at the famously. Famously, I think you would get it. It, it, it. it tells you that you feel bad about yourself. A word that feel bad about yourself starts with L. Lousy. Yes. All right. Uh, and what about abortive? There's a word there that tells you you are angry, a shade of anger. They are all five letters. Huh? Anyone? All right, so for abortive, it's irate. For bicket, it is irk. All right, and the one I love the most is devilish because devilish by itself, the word and the, the five letter word that you come to show. Um, Devil. Pardon? Someone said something? For devilish, what is the word of anger? Yes, live it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So I like using devilish because devilish and live it, you know, like you're a devil. So you probably be angry at the devil devilish, you know, it has shades of that meaning. All right. Okay. So how I do this is, uh, this is for higher level. I don't really teach this to any of the secondary students It's higher level and students who have, uh, who like this kind of games, you know, word games, you know. Uh, next. Now, this is something is fantastic. You call it the continuum, the, ang the continuum. It can be an anger continuum, can be the joint continuum. It can be the horror continuum, all right? So tell students that there are shades and scales, you know, shades of gray, so shades of anger, all right? And uh, like, for example, someone, like, for example, the word uh, annoyed could be there, some, uh, no, uh, sorry, irritated could be there. So uh, where do you think can be irritated? You know, where do you think irritated would be? All right. Now, there's no right or wrong answer for this. Okay. So the idea is because some students, what happened is this. They know the word. Like, for example, they say frustrated. Frustrated. Then you ask them from scale of 1 to 10. Let's say you draw a scale 1 to 10. Where is it? They'll pro they might just put to furious, you know. Uh, furious, you know. So you said, oh, you, if you are a scale of 8, you could be feeling furious. That's what you're feeling. But students, they only know I'm angry. Okay, I'm angry. Uh, so using a scale or a continuum will also help them. Okay, that's why I always ask students this. Oh, I said you are, they're like, they're feeling anxious. They usually say the word anxious or uncertain. Then I will ask, you know, so from a scale of one to 10, you know, where do you think is your, how anxious do you feel inside you? Then I say everyone feels differently. Huh? So they will tell me, oh, I'm at a two. Then I said, if it's at a two, you know, do you think you can manage it? Then they say, yes. And then I ask, what can you do? But remember, I was telling you about uh, those that have tears and things like that. There was a girl who did listening. Every time we did listening, the listening is about uh, 10 minutes huh, because we're listening to a short lecture. By the fourth minute, you can see she is her face is not moving. And then by the sixth and seventh minute, you can see there are tears welling in her eyes. You know, like she's very frustrated, that feeling. Uh, so I asked her, where was she? So she was able to tell me, she said, I'm a nine. <laughs> very anxious nine. Is it a nine? Okay. Okay. Now, this is a normal one. And normally what I do is, there is, uh, like, I, like the research have shown, uh, sensations, there's a link to sensation with the emotion. And with emotions, there's a link to attitude. All right, attitude. So if, especially if you're teaching personal narrative, the student can use this three, this variety, whether they are using their sensations to map what they're going through or their emotions, but also their attitude. For example, they're critical. Well, they're critical. Uh, and knowing that, knowing that it is a thought, critical and attitude is a thought, then you know that that can be changed, all right? Can be changed. Uh, but sometimes emotions and sensations, you can't change them because they're within you. And the emotions actually is the one that is guiding the attitude, all right? So this, this is a little bit. So what is the word that most of you can see? You know, the, the one that Facebook has, or whatever, they'll say, they look at things like that and they'll ask you, what is the first word you see and supposed to be the one that uh, tells you, 
what you're feeling. I can tell you from a counseling point of view, and that it's pop psychology and it's utter, utter not right. Okay. Uh, so don't believe it. Huh? But of course, for me, the word that I see right now is yes, I see the word jitri, second line, second line to the, from the bottom. All right. Jittery. <laughs> I'm feeling oh jittery right now. So that's a sensation I'm feeling. Okay. So Frank, the person say Frank, you see Frank. So Frank, what do you think? So yeah, it's an attitude, okay? It's an attitude, okay? Let's see. Oh, okay. So right now, I've given you a few examples of how to teach, and I'm sure all of you can do it. Now, I'm going to go to the last part because I'm not going to dwell with it. This last part, I'm going to show you a few things. These are all easily downloaded from, the, from Google, Mr. Google, okay? Now, you can see at... The right hand corner on the top, you have the emotion wheel. The emotion wheel is very helpful. If you are not sure of how the continuum, you can look at the emotion wheel and it's very well colored. All right. Then you also have the list of emotions. You can use, use a list. All right. Blank the list and ask them what other words you can use. You can have also what you call it, you can put to ball. You look at the one at the bottom where they have the figure, the sensation and the emotions come together. All right. And you also have pictures. All right, so you can, for younger group, you can give them pictures first and tell them what is it, you know. And from the pictures itself, you can come up to metaphor, how you want to describe them, you know. Uh, like, for example, the first one, you can say he's pulling his hair or, you know, he's clenching his fist, you know. Uh, and then there's the, the one walking under the cloud, it can be, you know, he's in doldrums, or even the one in grief, all right, the one in grief, all right. Uh, you can say overshadowed by grief. And there's one thing at the bottom of the right-hand corner, you see the joy. That part is talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary emotion. All right. So sometimes what happens is, most of the time what we do see, we do see is, is uh, could be a secondary emotion, it means the emotion that can be shown, not the emotions that they want to show. All right, because in Asian society, we have been taught not to show our emotions. So you can sort of like clean that. So all this exercise is to help you help the students be more self-aware of themselves and where they are. All right, let's go to perceiving correctly. Yeah? Let's go, go a little bit faster. Okay, now, as you know, that is the, how you get your emotion is through the situation, subjective. You may have some thoughts, then sensation, emotion, then the behavior. But underlying all this, underlying all this are perception, expectations, and yearnings of these students, all right? Uh, that's why students sometimes will tell you, I'm bored, okay? Because their expectation is that you're not moving, all right? Their yearning in life has not been realized probably inside. It's not up to you, not because of you, sorry, not because of you. And they are stuck there. So they are not sure, but they project it. They will project it through their behavior because that's what they feel, all right? They feel or what they think. But actually, deeper down, you have the perceptions, the expectations and yearnings that you have, all right? And that's where sometimes when you are dealing with a more mature students, it's good to able to ask them what are their values. Go talk to them about values, what they, what they value most, all right? And then from there, help them how to regulate their emotions from there. Values, with values, you're able to do that. Now, let's go to the next part. Same with the line. Let's look at, first of all, like the word angry, the one with the angry iceberg. Under, most of the time, people say they're angry. I'm angry, but actually underneath it is what you call that embarrassment, their annoyance, they feel offended, they are scared, all right? Okay, when you feel a strong emotion and, and if you, are, you, do, you never know how to deal with this emotion, what happens is always anger, all right? You can slant over to anger or you can slant over to passivity. We'll talk about that later. But just know that underneath that emotion that you see in class, all right, whether it's anxiety, it could be a lot of other emotions. All right. So let's look at the iceberg. The iceberg tells you something, and all right, that they are. So what's happening upside there? So the pattern of behavior is linked to the emotion. The emotion. Your emotion and how you behave is linked to a system. This system is the system you have learned at home. 
all right, in your family, all right, uh, how to respond or react to people. That's your, the system you have. And finally, go down what is your mental mode. What is your values, your belief, and your assumption? And all these actually basically, for example, I, I, I just give you a quick story. A friend of mine just recently got scammed on the internet, all right? She is around, she is in her 30s, all right? She's going to scan. And while processing with her means talking, right? processing means just talking what happened. Deep down in her was not the feeling of uh, fear or trauma or whatever, uh, being ashamed, she felt that she cannot trust anyone any longer. All right. And that was deep down. She has trust issues. So deep down is I cannot trust people. All right. So because the system that, you know, her past have told her that and her family or whatever have reinforced that. And later in life, when she works, whatever, she also doesn't. So she said, I will never trust now. Uh, she was scammed over the phone. All right, so you will not trust the phone anymore. That kind of feeling. Okay. Okay, so it's layer upon layer. All right. So when you have that, when so what in class, what happens is when you deal with negative emotions, the first thing you remember is don't take it personally. It's really not about you, right? Not about you. All right. And try not to calm students down. Keep quiet, keep quiet, don't do this, you know. Uh, and but the idea is to see identify the layers. How do you identify the layers? All right, you ask questions. We will go into that later, all right? You ask questions. You ask questions, what's happening? How are you feeling? And things like that. And if you have created a rapport with your students, you can definitely help them, all right? That's why if you have, you, they have the vocabulary and you have the skills, some little, not very difficult skills. Huh? Uh, you don't do this. Don't just, don't take it personally. Uh, you can, Bring them aside, you know, but because sometimes unless they're unruly, they're violent, then yes, you have, to, you have to stop them and do something. But most of the time, they're brewing inside. They're brewing inside, they're angry inside. I, I can tell you, I can say that, you know, when face-to-face -face class, I have this, and even online classes, I have this, okay? Uh, remember, those of you who went, come, came to my session last year, I told you about the student who wrote to me that I'm harassing her, humiliating her. Actually, <laughs> she was just using wrong vocabulary, all right? So when I talked to her, you know, and later find out what it was, oh, she just felt embarrassed. Embarrassed that, you know, she has to speak in front of the other students whom she thought was better than her, all right? Now, this is something from research about male and female, how they regulate their emotions, all right? As you can see, males, they say they found males have less intensely, less difficulties. Eh? Now, the reason why male all are lesser, eh? and I'm male, I can tell you, is because we are so used in pushing them down, and we have been taught not to regulate them. And also, and also, uh, something biological and hormonally, we are not so reactive to those emotions as such, whether positive or negative. So it is less, but it doesn't mean that we don't feel intensely, all right, okay? Uh, and if, if you're a, a woman, you will find that you are more intense. So if you're dealing with a female student, you know that their feelings are more intense. They have greater difficulty in moderating and especially if in situations where they are bullied and things like that in the class, all right, or cyberbullying, they find it much more difficult to overcome that than the male, all right, okay? Especially if there are no familial support. All right, so this, this is just a little thing I need. Uh, the new research is coming out with the word fawn. You heard of fight, flight, and freeze, right? Now new research is coming to fawn. What is fawn? Where? They perform on the surface. They want to please you to, in order not to feel so bad about themselves or whatever emotions they are feeling, all right? They want to engage, but they actually they're just complying, all right? They're complying. So in, in our class, unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of fawning students. I, I at least, I, I see a, quite a number of them. I don't have many with fight, okay? Because in Asian society, you... We don't teach the students to fight with their teachers, but we have a lot of flight, 
whether they are daydreaming, they are into fantasy, you know. So something is not so right. Or we have those of peace that don't want to talk. Uh, 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 okay. So the last three categories, we have more than the first category. Now, one of the things that we need to know when dealing with emotions that it can spiral, it can spiral down or it can spiral up. Okay, so this is the positive thing. Eh? Uh, it can spiral up. Eh? So if you are the type of teacher that can able to help alleviate the tension in class, that's good for you. If not, you have to learn because I want to tell you this, uh, anger begets anger. If you are frustrated, your, your students will be frustrated no matter how, uh, whether they're self-aware or not. The emotion transfers. Huh? Just remember that. If I don't take it personally and able to overcome that and move in a more positive era, your students will come along with you. All right? And then later on, you can talk to them. So what's wrong? Okay. Uh, okay. That's where we come. I also want to to show you this. This is called the yerkes dobson law, all right? Huh? You have, as you go into learning or performance or any of that, you have a period of what you call stress. Some of them call it U-stress, EU-stress, all right? U-stress, where they feel energized, you know? But a lot of them may feel distressed and you, therefore, you have to look into your students. Are they going through fatigue, exhaustion, ill health, or breakdown? In this area, if they are in this area of time, it may not be your class, but it can be something happening at home. All right. So the idea is to get them in the, the middle portion. All right. Visual ball. Now, if you have a difficult task, a difficult task, you will see that it takes longer, longer to it, you will do you you may you may have more distress first. All right. But if it's an easier one, then you may have it later but you have to watch out watch out for your students the reason i say this is because mine is a 20 week module i see them for 20 weeks four hours a day and so i can literally map how they are going through and usually uh by a certain week they are tired out and that's when i don't give much homework and i and i do more instead of uh you know this kind of uh happier things or just revisions happy or just play some games all right okay all right, we're coming to this. I'm, I want you to remember this. The language of the body is sensation. Our hearts communicate via feelings or emotions and our minds use thoughts. Thoughts alone cannot change someone. So if you are talking to a student, uh, you need to see it as a whole, whole package. All right. Now, what are some helpful tools? All right, my first couple tool is this. I love this the most. Questions are the answers. All right, so what do you think is my favorite question? Oh, what's happening? <laughs> uh, what's happening here, you know? Uh, oh, uh, what are you feeling? Sometimes they may not know it. Huh? Then the most important part is these questions. The questions must come out to be empathetic. It's like you are not, the questions should not come out. Like, Why are you feeling like that? Ah. That, that kind of very accusatory, very judgmental. But they say that, oh, I see you're feeling something here, you know, what, what is happening, you know? So they will tell you, they will literally tell you, all right? Because especially if you are a, a teacher, they have some kind, they know that you, you can guide them. So that's what they will happen. Huh? They, will, they will tell you. So questions are the answers, what's happening, you know? Uh, how is it affecting you? Uh, from a scale of one to 10, you know, uh, how would you, dis where do you think you are at this time, you know? And, and for example, the student who said, I humiliated her. Oh, I said, so the first thing I said, well, I'm so sorry. I used her same words. I said, I'm sorry I humiliated you, you know, you know, uh, but tell me, you know, how, how did you feel, how, in what ways do you think I humiliated you, you know? Uh, so she began to talk, you know, I just want to find out. You know, find a final so that I can change certain views words like that. And there was one student who came up to me, and then I could see this was like by the third week that I've known her. She keep coming in the groups, and then I, I suddenly I asked the question. I said, "Oh, I said, uh, how long now have you? Uh, are you overseas now?" He said, "For four weeks." Oh, I said, you know, so how 
Do you feel being away from your parents? And then you can see. So slowly by talking, I, and I don't do any counseling, I will say that, oh, you know, probably it would be good if you talk to someone about it. And so I link her to the counseling people in Monash. All right? So uh, having the questions and able to tell them they can be well aware of what they're going through. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Ah, okay, I'm going to do this. This you can do very easily. You can do a body scan. You can do a body scan. You can say, what sensations are you right, right now? What sensations are you feeling in your body? You know, is your buttocks feeling? Uh -huh. Then I can say, how strong is the physical sensation? Uh, so, so you can use these questions as, oh, what emotions are you feeling? What sensations are you feeling? How different is this sensation from normal? Uh, you can ask them that. Then you can also say, does this sensation energize or tire you? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to say, how, how are you breathing? Okay, you know, how am I breathing? How are you breathing? How are you breathing? How am I breathing? All right. How is the breathing? Shallow breathing will give you that sense of uh, flight. All right. So one of the things that I do teach them apart from body scan, all right, body scan and putting on the music is this last part that I do. Teach them how to breathe. All right. Teach them to breathe. Teach them breathing slowly. By breathing itself, uh, you I need perhaps you need want to take this down the book by uh, Nestor James Nestor Breath, the new science of a lost art. Okay, James Nestor, the name of the book is called Breath, the new science of a lost art. Very interesting book, and you can use that with your students. There are quite practical exercises. And the last part I want to leave you with this: when we are teaching, go for connection before correction, and go for empathy before education. If you have connection, if we have empathy, we will get education and we will also get accuracy because they will want to listen to us. So thank you. Um, is there any questions? I think I have three minutes for questions. No questions? No questions and thank you for coming. Uh, you can go for the next one. I'm going to put on, put on this one, okay? Bye-bye. Thank you, Tim. Very insightful. Thank you. Thank you.